As, as far as we know, no. If you start with a really symmetric lattice like this, the best algorithms we know to find short vectors are the L cubed and BKZ L cubed algorithms. And you feed this lattice in, and remember what L cubed is doing, it's swapping things and change, okay? Within just the first few iterations, it has completely messed up the um, underlying symmetry of the inputs. Um, and it doesn't seem to run faster than more or less random lattices of the same thing. Having said that, cryptographers are very, very conservative. And I left off about 12 varies in that sentence. Um, so people, yes, are worried about having the symmetry. That's one reason, for example, actually the Falcon, I guess, which is the one I'm most familiar with, recommends using either XTN plus one within a power of two, or XTN minus X minus one with some various n values, or maybe plus x, plus one. Anyway, which gets rid of the cyclotomic symmetries. And it's there not because someone knows how to attack the cyclotomic one better, but simply for caution. Um, and you can even go further than that. I mean, in some sense, GGH should be more secure, maybe, than any of these. These have... Not, well, I mean, these are based on rings and ideals in rings. And simply having that multiplication structure is extra structure. But again, no one's been able to exploit that significantly. And the learning with errors I mentioned, it's also used in some of the NIST, um, the NIST selections. Um, there's a non, there's a sort of pure learning with errors, but it's not that efficient, and there's a ring learning with errors that has an underlying ring. It's more efficient, but again, people wonder, does that structure? Yeah. I, I've answered this too long. I, I actually hate it when someone asks, when I'm in the audience, someone asks a question, and the speaker goes on and on, but I still have one more thing to say, which anytime there's symmetry, you need to worry about it and look at it, but no one's found any problems. Um, any other questions? All the way back. I, I cannot hear it. Bjorn's going to come back with a microphone. <laughs> Okay. And I will mention, this is partly masks, partly distance, and partly my hearing's not that great at this point, so it's not you. Go ahead. Uh, the GGH uh, protocol, which relies on CVP... Hold it closer to your mouth. The GGH protocol, which relies on CVP, it kind of feels like a characteristic zero version of uh, decoding an error-correcting code in order to decrypt. It's, it's, it's very closely related to, to, to uh, error-correcting codes, yeah. Um, and there are other quantum secure, as far as you know, public key crypto systems based purely on error correcting codes. Um, it's a little bit different, but I mean, the decryption process for an error correcting code, I think, is actually more efficient than, than, than this even, or, or more direct. Um, but, but yes, they are closely related. And their key sizes are roughly the same size also. They grow like N squared. Um, yeah? Uh, you mentioned that the i uh, uh, You mentioned that the i uh, crypto system had average case worst case equivalents. Uh, could, is, is there anything similar that could be said about GGH or n -true? Um Again, not my area of expertise, really, but my understanding is that I don't think there are average case, worst case reductions for NTRU um, or for GGH as, as it's, it's formulated. Um, or for, for learning with errors either. There are various, re there are various sorts of reduction things. So for, for example, I'm pretty sure like for, like for Entru, you can prove that someone who can, yeah, maybe you can prove that, that someone who can decrypt messages actually can 
recover the, uh, a usable private key and use it to encrypt also. Th you know, there are reductions like that. Um, I'm more familiar with those for the signature schemes. Um, yeah, it's a huge industry, much of it quite interesting, much of it very technical, of trying to say that solving this problem is equivalent to solving that problem or allows you to solve that problem. And yeah, and all sorts of techniques have been used for that. For example, uh, um, a lot of graph theory and expander graphs and stuff, sometimes you can use to analyze the difficulty of one thing in terms of another. Yeah. Sure. Other questions? Over here. your convolution product? Uh, good question. So, so convolution product is the same as the ring modded out by XTN minus one. If you change to some other quotient ring, um, yeah, if you change to XTN plus one, um, it's essentially a convolution product, but there are a whole bunch of minus signs introduced, as you'd expect. If you change to XTN minus X minus one, it's not a convolution product at all. It's just a quotient ring product. Um, uh, you can write down the matrix for it, but the, the matrix for multiplication will be less symmetric. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's usually better to think of it. Well, the general case, it's better to think of the rings. The reason it's useful thinking of convolution product is, if you're using that case is because you can do the multiplications using discrete Fourier transforms, and they get much faster. Okay, so it looks, uh, yeah, so the convolution product, you're, you're doing n dot products, right? Because each coordinate's a dot product. So it sounds like it's n squared multiplications. It's not, it's n log n multiplications. Because you can use discrete Fourier transforms. Or what's called Kar Karatsuba multiplication to, okay. Yeah, was there, a, yeah. Yes. Oh, so you mentioned earlier that we cannot really just naively implement the algorithms as they presented here to real world problems. Like uh, otherwise, they are easily broken. So I'm wondering if you can give maybe just like some um, examples of how the, like what modifications people need to make. Um, okay. Yeah. And and when I said easily, I kind of meant that there's potential ways. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. I I guess the. <coughs> most natural example um, is if you don't introduce randomness. You remember the thing last time I said you, you should take a random bit string and then XOR the message with the random string and then encrypt that. If you don't do that, if you just send the message, um, so for example in RSA, if someone could guess the first half of the bits in your message, it turns out they can then recover the other half of the bits. Uh, this is a beautiful construction of Don Coppersmith's. Um, now that may seem so, I mean, how could someone guess the first half of the bits in your message? But, you know, I mean, you might very well start your message, you know, dear, and your friend's name. Uh, we had an interesting week. I mean, you can guess what, you know, parts of the message. And in fact, of course, this is how old style decryption went frequently. You tried to guess a phrase that was in the, the message. Um, so that's, that's one example of, of where you need to be careful. Um, for, yeah, for, for El Gamal, it depends on the discrete log, right? So you're working in Z mod P, the multiplicative group of Z mod P, right? Well, it turns out if P minus one is a product of fairly small primes, it's easy to solve the discrete log problem. Who knew? Um, it turns out, and in the elliptic curve case, there are even a lot more situations where it turns out it's easy to break that particular one. Um, and we don't really have great proof. So for the elliptic curve crypto systems, basically the way you pick your elliptic curve and your point is you pick a curve and a point that isn't in one of these categories we know are bad. But we don't know there aren't other bad <laughs> categories. Yeah, so it's sort of answer your question. Okay, sure. 
Okay, so we're at 929, so I think we should probably wrap it up for today. And I just want to remind you that today's problem session this morning's is also Drew Sutherland's uh, lectures. So he'll, he'll be doing that kind of stuff, okay? And tomorrow we'll be back doing uh, crypto stuff. Um, in the problem session. Okay? okay so I'll you. see everyone tomorrow. Thank you.